tonight. Desperate times. Gaza families suffer through dwindling resources with Ramadan underway. Children face starvation as Israeli forces threw. Requesting restraint. China calls on all parties involved in the Red Sea conflict to scale back on the attacks. Houthi forces refuse to hear any warning. Russia decides. Voting kicks off across Russia as the state heads to the polls. And Putin prepares for victory. And Turkey trouble. A certain Thanksgiving bird goes all guns blazing against the cops. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and welcome to World News Tonight. It's finally Friday, so thank you very much for tuning in as you have done over the past week. Well, with the weekend quickly approaching, we have a wrap-up of all the stories we have kept you updated on over the past few days, starting with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Well, the month of Ramadan is not a celebratory one for those in the West Bank. The humanitarian crisis in the region continues to eat into the already dwindling supplies in Gaza, leaving children starving. As the evening prayer echoes across rubble-strewn Gaza, the Abu Rizek family break their day's fast. The Muslim holy month of Ramadan looks very different for them this year. Usually, families gather with friends and neighbours to eat, pray and celebrate together. But now the Abu Rizek family sit in the wreckage of their home, having scraped together enough food for iftar, the sunset breakfast after a day without sustenance. Many others in the stricken Palestinian enclave are even less fortunate. Starvation looms here. The UN has warned that at least 576,000, that's one quarter of the population, are on the brink of famine. The war in Gaza was triggered on October 7th when Hamas fighters rampaged into Israel, killing 1,200 people and seizing 253 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Israel's relentless ground and air offensive since then has killed more than 31,000 people, according to health authorities in Hamas-run Gaza, and the majority of the enclave's 2.3 million inhabitants have been displaced. Hopes for a Ramadan ceasefire disintegrated, with Israel and Hamas arguing over the terms. With almost no commercial food imports, most Gazans are now entirely dependent on food aid. Many eat only at communal soup kitchens, like this one run by volunteers in Rafa. They offer out plastic bowls to those in need, including people seeking their iftar meal. This man says he is 60 years old, and has never seen a Ramadan like this. In previous years, people were happy. There used to be decorations, food and drinks, he says. But this year, there is sadness and despair. But moving into the Red Sea now, China has called on all parties involved in tensions in the Red Sea to exercise restraint and stop further actions that may ratchet up the tensions. Speaking at a United Nations Security Council meeting at the UN headquarters in New York, China's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Gong Shuang, said that no country may misinterpret the Security Council resolutions and use force against Yemen without UN authorization. Zhang said that the tensions in the Red Sea are a significant manifestation of the spillover effects of the conflict in the war ravaged in the Gaza Strip. China once again urges Israel to immediately stop military operations in the Gaza Strip and stop collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Meanwhile, the lead of the Yemeni Houthi armed forces said that since the outbreak of the latest round of the Palestinian-Israel conflict in October last year, the Houthi rebels armed forces have attacked a total of 73 Israel-linked ships and warships. Over the past week, the United States and the UK have launched dozens of airstrikes against Houthi targets on land and at sea. Al Houthi once again emphasized the Houthi position of supporting Palestinians, saying that the Houthis will continue to prevent Israel linked ships from sailing in the Red Sea and will even prevent the relevant ships from passing through the Indian Ocean to the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. 
Moving on to Russia now. Russia has begun heading to the polls to elect their president tonight. Well, of course, it comes as no surprise that all the money is on President Putin to be re-elected. But there are concerns with safety as several regions have been alerted to remain indoors due to missile threats. For more on this, we have other than the world news. Special correspondent Nirandi Gamage from Kursk in Russia. Nirandi. Yes, Sanradi. Russians headed to the polls to vote in a presidential election today for the first day of a ballot that will be held across three days. Incumbent Vladimir Putin is all but certain to win against three challengers, none of whom has criticized him. Putin's popularity is also high amid strong support for Russia in their conflict in Ukraine. Putin's approval rating is currently 86%, up from 71% shortly before the invasion of Ukraine. High officials such as Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Chief of Staff Valery Gerasimov have been seen voting in the presidential election as well. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Nirandi Gamage from Kursk in Russia. Moving on, the trilateral partnership drills between China, Iran and Russia, aptly named Security Bond 2024, has just been drawn to a close, with the nations agreeing to foster better relations between each other. On Thursday, China, Iran and Russia completed all exercises of the four-day trilateral naval drills in the Gulf of Oman. According to the Chinese Navy, the joint maritime exercises, titled Security Bond 2024, have further promoted trilateral exchanges and cooperation. The drills began on Tuesday with a focus on firing at sea, communication and simulation of anti-piracy and rescue missions with the scenario involving hijacked merchant vessels. The Chinese Navy deployed their destroyer Urumqi among other ships, whilst Russia dispatched a guided missile cruiser and Iran more than 10 vessels for the joint exercise. An officer of the Chinese Navy said that the three sides took turns to command and coordinate closely. Let's go in for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more global updates. We'll be right back. And on the road to the White House tonight, voters are set to choose the next president of the United States, with the end result expected to be either a second term for President Joe Biden or a return to the White House for former President Donald Trump. Every vote matters, but the electoral results in a handful of key swing states will play major roles in determining the ultimate outcome. President Joe Biden's re-election prospects largely hinge on the so-called blue wall, a tree of industrial states that offer the ultimate test for his message of manufacturing revival. Michigan had been a reliably blue Midwestern state in the recent decades after voting exclusively Republican in the 1970s and the 1980s. But similar to Wisconsin, it became a major battleground after Trump won there by less than 11,000 votes in 2016. Biden notched a victory there over Trump in 2020, though by a wider margin. A February survey showed the economy was the top issue for close to a third of Michigan voters. That issue was followed by immigration, threats to democracy, health care, housing affordability, education, crime and abortion access. And now Trump's legal troubles. With every win, it seems there is a bit of a loss for Trump's legal team. As a federal judge denied former U.S. President Donald Trump's request to dismiss a criminal case that charges him with illegally holding on to classified documents after leaving the White House. A federal judge on Thursday denied Donald Trump's request to dismiss a criminal case that charges him with illegally holding on to classified documents. The decision followed a hearing earlier in the day where Judge Eileen Cannon referred to President Joe Biden's handling of sensitive government records as she considered the matter. With the former president and Republican presidential candidate in the courtroom, the judge who was appointed by him said, It's uncontested that no former executive or former vice president was exposed to criminal liability other than Trump for allegedly mishandling sensitive government documents. A federal prosecutor last month said Biden would not face criminal charges for knowingly keeping classified documents after he left the vice presidency in 2017. 
Mike Pence, who served as vice president under Trump, also was investigated but not charged for keeping classified documents at his Indiana home. Last year, special counsel Jack Smith charged Trump with violating national security laws by illegally holding onto classified documents. While Biden and Pence cooperated with investigators, prosecutors have said Trump discussed lying to those who were trying to recover the documents and move them around his Mar-a-Lago resort to prevent their discovery. Some of those documents discussed national security issues, including nuclear weapons capabilities and U.S. vulnerability to military attack, according to prosecutors. The judge, though, did seem skeptical of several arguments that Trump's lawyers have made in their efforts to dismiss the case, including that the charges were vague. The timing of a trial remains uncertain, with both sides acknowledging the current May start date will need to be postponed. The start date for what is expected to be Trump's first criminal trial could be postponed as well. Prosecutors in the New York State case involving hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels said Thursday they were not opposed to a 30-day delay in the trial, currently set to begin on March 25th due to a recent disclosure of thousands of pages of documents by federal prosecutors. And now on the rapidly developing updates on South Korea's doctor walkouts. South Korea's health minister Cho Kyo-hong had made a last-ditch appeal to medical faculty professors against walking off their jobs in support of the almost month-long trainee doctor strike. Professors from 19 of South Korea's roughly 40 medical schools will decide whether or not to collectively hand in their resignation letters. So far, among the so-called Big Five hospitals in Seoul, professors of Seoul National University, the University of Ulsan and Catholic University have finalized their decision to submit resignation letters if the government takes any legal action such as suspending junior doctors' licenses. According to an emergency response committee of professors formed on Tuesday, they will finish discussions by Friday to show support and to safeguard junior doctors who walked out around four weeks ago. The health ministry on Friday morning urged the medicine professors not to resign. The government once again urges the junior doctors to come back to the field for the public and for their co-workers. Doctors can be respected when they stay with the patients. Some of the general hospitals which filled vacancies left by the departure of most junior doctors with professors are now under emergency response measures. Seoul National University Pundang Hospital is now operating surgeries only for emergency, severe cases due to the lack of doctors, and the number of surgeries has decreased by about 30 percent to 50 percent compared to before. The current conflict between the government and junior doctors was sparked by the government's plan to increase medical school enrollment by 2,000 places starting in 2025. Doctors insist that an expanded quota cannot be a fundamental solution to break long-standing issues like a shortage of essential medical services such as pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology. The government said the quota increase is inevitable, as South Korea currently has just 2.6 doctors per 1,000 people, far below the OECD average of 3.7, and that it is needed to resolve regional health care disparities. The government has unveiled the allocation plan for the new quarter on Thursday, with 80 percent of new med school spots going to schools outside the capital region. New frontiers for space travel have been expanded on as a mega rocket developed by SpaceX for future Mars exploration conducted its third test flight, reaching record heights. The Starship flew halfway around the world for about 48 minutes but was unfortunately lost before re-entry. SpaceX's Starship, a mega rocket designed for future Mars exploration, lifted off on Thursday from the Starbase facility in Boca Chica, Texas. It was the third launch following two tests that both ended explosively last year. And while this launch didn't end successfully, it did achieve a number of milestones, getting SpaceX closer to its goal. 
The rocket flew halfway around the world for about 48 minutes, reaching a maximum speed of over 26,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 234 kilometers. However, when Starship began its descent and re-entered the atmosphere, red flames appeared due to frictional heat, and it is presumed that the spacecraft was burned up during re-entry as the live broadcast of the rocket was cut off. While Thursday's launch fell short of its plan to splash down in the Indian Ocean after a 65-minute flight, it provided much-needed data for the team. The world's largest and most powerful rocket to date reached orbital speed for the first time and flew a record distance. With the data it gathered, it's now in a position to move on to more complex test flights, such as carrying NASA astronauts to the moon's surface. Just like SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets, the Starship is designed to be fully reusable and is considered crucial in the company's mission to carry humans to Mars for the very first time. Some unfortunate news for climate goals tonight. Shell weakened its 2030 carbon reduction target and scrapped a 2035 objective, citing expectations for strong gas demand and uncertainty in the energy transition, even as it affirmed a plan to cut emissions to net zero by 2050. Energy giant Shell scaled back climate targets on Thursday. It weakened its carbon reduction target for 2030 and cancelled an objective set for 2035. CEO Wal Sawan told this was because the outlook for the global energy transition was still uncertain. He further said trying to be forensic about Shell's emissions in 2035 was perilous. But the firm stuck to its plan to cut emissions to net zero by 2050. The changes are a key part of Sawan's strategy revamp to boost returns. He wants to focus on higher margin projects, steady oil output and growth in the production of natural gas. Rival BP made a similar move last year when it pulled back on oil production and emission reduction targets. The companies have faced growing investor pressure to boost returns. Shell said it will target a 15 to 20 percent reduction in net carbon intensity of its energy products by 2030 compared with 2016 intensity levels. It had previously aimed for a 20 percent cut. Shell said it believed gas and liquefied natural gas will play a critical role in the energy transition and sees it replacing more polluting carbon in power plants. Shell also maintained its target to halve emissions from its own operations by 2030. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. When caring for an animal, it's often the case that it will bond very greatly to its initial caregiver. We've seen this most times, how ducklings will imprint on humans and how lions can become little cats with their handlers. Well, how does one target this issue of domestication in wild animals? Well, you simply become the animals themselves. What the heck? It's a woman in a giant fox head, and she's feeding an orphaned baby fox called a kit. It may look kind of silly, but the folks taking turns feeding the little one say it's saving her life. Wearing a fox mask while her vision when she first opens her eyes isn't going to be fully developed, she'll see an outline. I want that outline and that fuzzy picture to be a fox. We don't want the first thing that they see in this world to be a human. The goal is to return the baby fox to nature without making any significant human connection. No, I don't talk to her. I want her to hear nature sounds. And thankfully, we've been able to find other fox kits. So she's going to be able to have her little conversations with other fox kits soon. Just don't let the baby see. It's a human under the mask. The goal is to get them back out into the wild for a great chance of survival where they can recognize their own species and continue to reproduce. And finally tonight, we've got some turkey troubles. Officers of the law that were minding their business and going about their jobs as usual were attacked by a certain bird. The hunter has become the hunted. Take a look. Get back up, back up. It's an invasion of turkeys. We are back, ma'am. Give me a second. Right. 
at not one, but two traffic stops. Check it, check it, check it. I guess you're up to date. What? What is... This one happened in Florida. Except for I'm getting attacked by a chicken right now. At first, the deputy thought they were chickens. Clearly, they were mad at being misidentified. Somebody better come get that chicken. <laughs> Another similar incident happened further north in Ohio. <laughs> What cologne are these officers wearing that seem to attract our favorite Thanksgiving centerpiece? Well, clearly they were very offended at getting mislabeled. The cops couldn't help but check it out. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this Friday night, wrapping up the week. We'll see you again on Monday with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good weekend.